Hello and welcome to our open online briefing about COVID-19 and responses uh, for today, 4th of March, 2022. You're wonderful to see very familiar faces here, but also more friends joining. And um, today I would like to be quite short in my opening remarks. And uh, if uh, we have uh, Frank Atherton here, I will stop quite quickly and invite Frank to comment. I think you'll hear Frank and uh, hello. And uh, I'm also expecting that uh, Maria Van Kakova might be here and she will be invited to join. And then uh, we will get going with the discussion quite quickly. Just um, a few quick comments uh, before I get started. Uh, the first is to invite Catherine Deland to welcome everybody. Thanks, David, and happy good Friday, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Always lovely to see you at the end of a week. It's the best part. Um, then it gets us really ready for a strong weekend. Um, I just want to mention that Jack Broom is here with us from Live Illustration. Thanks again to Live Illustration for always supporting us and to Jack for being here. We're really looking forward to seeing your illustration when uh, as it develops. Um, also to mention that this is being recorded, you will have already seen that pop up. Hey, nice one, Jack, I love it. Um, and then uh, you, you will already uh, have seen that this is being recorded. We put these uh, OOBs, these online briefings onto the Forestd website. So if you have an intervention at any point that you feel would be best not reflected in the public, please do let us know. I'll make sure that my address and Mahika's address is in the chat. You probably already have it, but just in case. Um, and we'll make sure that we edit appropriately. Um, it's a big week and big thoughts. So I hand back to David so we don't waste any of this important hour. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much indeed. We're here, uh, many people from the team of 4SD. So I, I will stick to 10 minutes uh, opening today and then we will start the conversation. And uh, we may then go back into some more from me, we'll see. But uh, let's just uh, play it by, by ear. Um, I use three words at the moment. Protect people who are vulnerable, prevent transmission, and prepare for surges. I can remember them, they begin with P. Uh, I, I felt that the focus on prevention, preventing transmission is easier than the focus on restrictions. And I'll just explain exactly uh, what I'm getting at. Just the fundamental issue, we still have an active pandemic in the world. We still have large numbers of people reportedly uh, being ill. And uh, uh, every 24 hours, uh, we are seeing somewhere at the moment in the order of a million cases. Uh, and uh, every 24 hours, we're seeing somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people dying of COVID. So just to remind everybody, this pandemic is still very active and it's particularly active at the moment in uh, countries in the Pacific region, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, New Zealand, but also in Hong Kong. And there are signs that there may be a resurgence due in Europe uh, in the next few weeks. So prevent transmission. Well, where you've got a lot of virus, we think it's worthwhile preventing transmission because even if quite uh, people, people are not dying in large numbers with the current variants that are moving around. Uh, long COVID is an absolutely massive challenge. Uh, I've heard that there are really very large numbers of people reported to have long COVID in the UK, and I'm inviting conversations about that. 200,000 new long COVID uh, cases reported in the last month, according to a report in the Daily Telegraph and people in the 35 to 49 year old 
age bracket most likely to report our ongoing problems. So, you know, do not, uh, let's not treat this as a trivial a virus. Let's recognize that therefore it is desirable where there's a lot of virus to be preventing transmission. It's desirable to be protecting those who are vulnerable and it's desirable to be preparing for further surges. <clears throat> To do this, people do need to know where the virus is. And that's why I continue to urge uh, a sufficient testing in order to provide communities with that information. I think it's rather difficult to have societies learning to live with COVID and not having information about what the virus is doing and also not having information about whether there are new variants. And I also believe that no country looking ahead can afford to neglect the development of public health services. If there's one thing I have learned in the last two years plus, it is that without public health services, this is hard work to take forward. Now, supposing you're in Britain and you've watched a very careful effort by by authorities to shift to a situation where it is people themselves in their communities taking decisions about what to do about this virus, what's the kind of signal that might be needed to help to remind people that there's still a lot of care needed and perhaps to remind people that uh, there is a case for wearing masks and maintaining distance and so on. Well, my colleagues and I think that uh, at the emergence of a, another variant, if that does become something that is talked about, a variant that is perhaps more transmissible than, or perhaps with a different profile in terms of illness compared with Omicron, perhaps that will be the signal. It will be necessary to have a clear signal for when it'll be necessary perhaps to shift direction. And I'd be very interested to hear from you about signals. Let me just say that when Omicron appeared, there were quite a lot of projections made in the UK about what would happen uh, as a result of that variant. And um, I was very interested to see a piece by the science editor in uh, the London Times yesterday, saying that modelers in uh, the group called SAGE, which is advising governments on uh, infectious diseases, that modelers told uh, the Commons Science and Technology Committee uh, day before yesterday, that in mid-December, the SAGE presented to the government a range of scenarios and that despite their scenarios, uh, they found that actually Omicron was associated with a much lower death rate than was predicted. And the modelers said, well, their models were wrong because they didn't predict how much behavior change would be undertaken by the British public of their own volition uh, because of the arrival of this new variant. Well, I don't see that as uh, modelers were wrong. I see it as modelers were giving an assessment of where things might have gone, but they didn't get that far because there was an incredible concerted effort by people in Britain during the month, the weeks of uh, December and also leading into January to reduce the number of contacts that they had each day. And, and that's been corroborated by work, by, by statistical work, I mean, in the UK. So I want to stress that there is, as far as I'm concerned, some circumstantial evidence that during the weeks of December and the weeks of early January, British people did very definitely reduce the number of contacts they had because of anxieties about Omicron, the new variant that had just appeared, and that that seems to be the explanation that is given 
for the uh, impact of Omicron being far lower than was predicted by the modelers. And the reason why I'm saying that is that I find that really an impressive finding. Again, if it's corroborated, what that shows is that after two years of dealing with this pandemic, that there's evidence that British people are actually taking action themselves in the light of information received to reduce the risks that they and others are transmitting the infection. Uh, and that is, uh, for me, a really, really important sign. I wanted to just give you a couple of other things that uh, I thought you would want to hear. The, the virus is most definitely still circulating in quite dramatic surges from place to place, often quite narrowly confined surges. And so as we go around the world, even though numbers are just starting to come down uh, after the Omicron surge, there, is, there are reports of difficulty. So in Chile, hospitals with intensive care units close to capacity. I've already mentioned Solomon Islands where our hospitals are full. American Samoa declaring a code red for community transmission of the virus. And then Thailand, the Ministry of Health raising the COVID-19 alert level to level four. Hong Kong, where it's actually been quite, quite difficult to cope with uh, what is a spiraling outbreak with crowds of critically ill patients, low oxygen supplies, and challenges with hygiene being reported by public health staff. And indeed, some of the food uh, outlets in Hong Kong apparently limiting the amounts of items that people can, can buy because of concerns about shortages. And then Afghanistan, uh, aid groups warning that a spike in COVID-19 infections combined with a measles outbreak of compounded health emergencies. All this is taking place at the time when Italy, Czech, Iceland, Canada, Korea, and Japan are all announcing that they are easing restrictions around social distancing and other such things, but still inviting their publics to be really careful of this virus. So it's a time still of spikes and surges. It's a time when uh, prevention, protection and preparation seem to be absolutely key. Uh, it's a time when we need to be alert for new variants. And it's a time when I would like all of us to continue to work together and to demonstrate that in tackling the challenges of the future, there is no alternative but to work well together, even working well with people who we don't get on with, to maintain communication, to maintain conversation, and to believe in dialogue and diplomacy as the way to deal with conflict and to do everything possible to avoid the use of violence as a means for resolving conflict. It's something that I personally believe in, I suspect everybody, all 39 of us believe in, and which I would like us to be demonstrating constantly through the way in which we're working on COVID-19. Thank you, those are my opening remarks. I'd like to uh, invite now comments. I see there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. And Catherine, I hope that um, you will uh, do exactly what you've said. And um, I thought it might be a good idea if we invite people who are putting things in the chat to comment. But I did want to just uh, to go to Frank Atherton first of all, because he's here and I promised him uh, just in case he has to get off quickly, because I know 
he's carrying a huge responsibility. Frank, what does it feel like to be being the chief medical officer of your country and uh, managing these issues at this time? David, thanks for that. Yeah, what does it feel like? It feels like an absolute privilege, you know, and, uh, you know, we all, we're all here for purpose. And, you know, uh, that's how I've kind of felt for the last two years. But, you know, I'll just give you a quick overview, maybe, of, uh, you know, the situation here in, in uh, Wales in particular, UK more generally. But it does touch on some of the themes you've mentioned. Have I got a couple of minutes, David? Is that OK? Yes, I was being quick because I wanted you to have some time. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Well, look, I mean, in, in Wales, you know, things are pretty stable in terms of community transmission, but stable, as you kind of imply, there's still quite a high levels of transmission. You know, there's still a lot of it about. Um, uh, uh, but it is stable and improving. You know, we are coming out or through, let's say, the Omicron wave. Uh, so community rates are going down. And hospital rates, uh, you know, are pretty stable as well or, or slightly improving. What we've been very fortunate with, with the Omicron wave, of course, is that we're not seeing a lot of people going into ITU. So, so you know, intensive care. So, uh, you know, what, what it means really is that, um, you know, if, if we think about Wales as a population of three million people, give or take, um, we have currently 800 people in hospital with COVID. So that's still a, a, a significant number. It's about... Uh, one twelfth to one fifteenth of our total bed numbers. So it's still putting pressure on the system. Um, we've got 10 people, 11 people in ITU, in intensive care, very small numbers compared with previous waves, but still people are coming to harm. And we have on average three to 10 people a day dying and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So, so you're right, David, that the message you know, has to be that all those things are improving. We're not out of the woods. There's a little bit of a sting in the tail on a UK basis because one of my colleagues, my good, good friends up, up in Scotland, Gregor Smith, you know, he's my counterpart up there. You know, they are seeing a bit of an uptick in the hospitalisation rates up there. And that's probably due to one of two things. One is either, well, probably both things actually. One is that the BA2 subvariant of Omicron uh, is taking off up there and that seems to lead to more hospitalization uh, and the second thing is that um, you know it may be an impact of vaccine waning vaccine effectiveness waning uh, because it's predominantly in older people so it's just some another reminder that we need to you know, not let our guard down and keep watching things I, I, as you know david i'm sure and colleagues you know in the uk it would join that list of countries which uh, where, where the, the, the <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't talk about restrictions, I talk about protections, where the protections mm. are being uh, gradually eased. Uh, Wales, interestingly, is on a slower track than some of the other UK nations on that. And I, I like to think that that's why we have the lowest rates at the moment. Uh, we have, uh, of course, it's always difficult to interpret the testing rates, but we do have ONS, that's the Office for National Statistics, does a, a random survey of people in the four nations of the UK. And so we, every a uh, week or two, we get a, a, an objective figure as to what the prevalence is. Um, anyway, we, we are uh, re removing restrictions. Politicians have to do that. You know, they have to give people hope. Um, but at the same time, we have to give them the message that it isn't over and that we may need to escalate things again. I'm sure lots of different countries are producing their transitional plans. In, in um, Wales, we call it um, uh, Together for a Safer Future. We just launched a plan today, which is kind of pandemic to endemic, uh, uh, moving from the emergency response to the, the long-term chronic response that we're going to need because COVID is going to be with us for some time. Um, we are moving away from mass community testing, but we are looking to retain testing and have testing in a more uh, targeted way. So we have to test uh, for people coming into hospital who are coming to harm, not least because there are, of course, antivirals which can uh, help people. We have to test to protect people, particularly in vulnerable settings, um, uh, hospitals, care homes, prisons, those closed settings where we know that the virus can spread very quickly. And your point as well, David, we have to test for surveillance, both to spot new variants and to be able to respond when we see them. So that's actually all in our plan. So what, what your, you know, your, 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 your things today are, are very resonant with. Now, um, just a, a quick word on the modeling. I, I have, I, I started, Two years ago, I was quite a skeptic about the modelling, uh, but I've become quite a fan of it. I, you know, it, it is very useful. But modelling, of course, is not 
the same as prediction. It's just, as you say, it's telling people what might happen and, and um, asking uh, for, for a response or suggesting the response which might avoid uh, harm. So the modeling, you're right, with uh, Omicron was, was off beam and it was off beam uh, possibly. And uh, I, I like your, uh, your hypothesis that it's uh, uh, behavioral change because I think that that is part of it. But of course, as we discussed last time we met, Omicron was less uh, harmful. It was less of a deep lung issue that so we were lucky. My, my point to politicians here is always that it's better to be wise than to be lucky. It's nice to be lucky, but it's better to, to be wise. Um, so, you know, we are on a, a reasonably um, uh, positive trajectory here, uh, but always having to be cautious. And in our plans, we talk about a COVID stable situation, which is kind of where we are at the moment, COVID stable or COVID improving. Uh, uh, but uh, watch very carefully. And if we need to move to COVID urgent, uh, that's, that, you know, that, that, that has to happen. And, and so we need to take the communities with us on that and for them to understand that it's not over and that we may have to escalate some of these measures uh, if things go awry in terms of community transmission, in terms of increased hospitalization rates, uh, increase, increase people going into intensive care. Those are the things we need to watch, or indeed the new variants, which uh, you know may come come out of the woodwork. I'll stop there, David. But it's it's uh, really interesting to uh, to uh, map what we've been doing in Wales with uh, the global kind of picture you're giving. Yes, uh, it's lovely that you're here. Uh, I hope you can stay. Uh, if you have to leave at any point and need to share, please send me something in the chat, or better still just put your hand up and get my attention. Um, and, and Frank, it's lovely. Um, uh, I, and others who would like to speak, uh, please um, either raise your hand using the reactions button or um, uh, send a message in the chat. We're looking at it. Now, I'll just tell you, we've had some comments from Annie Felton, from Rebecca Cantor, and from Karen Kaplan as well. And then I also saw a question from Laura Spinney, uh, which um, I think we, we, we ought to discuss. It's quite an interesting one. Um, so uh, if that's possible, and um, uh, Catherine, I'd like to stop at uh, the top of the hour or something like that. Perhaps you could stop me and just give Jack a chance to show his picture. But for now, let's go um, to Annie. Um, thanks, uh, David. I, my first reaction when we were sitting here was just almost a mental jolt because of what's going on in Ukraine and, um, and Russia. And I was first out there over 50 years ago, and it's one of my main areas of um, uh, activity. Um, and so it is... I think in terms of um, COVID out there, who knows what's going to happen? Um, the level of destruction is getting worse. And, um, you know, I, that's obviously painful for everybody out there. Uh, and I, I think the challenge then is under those circumstances, how to get um, people still thinking about ever present problems just like COVID and I haven't got an answer to that. Um, on a more positive note in my um, uh, first comment, I, the University of Essex, which is just around the corner from here, we've just launched a, um, a new Institute of Public Health and Wellbeing, which is a, I think a bit more positive than um, what I'm mainly thinking about at the moment. I was Looking at pictures, um, as everybody noticed this, of um, old adolescent children in a subway station in Kiev, all wearing masks, quite impressive, mm. and wondering what that means. I mean, the reality is that there's an awful lot of COVID in both um, Russia and in Ukraine. And so um, your point is well taken that that in the current circumstances, there could well be uh, high, bigger surges and nastier surges coming. It's just difficult to know and probably won't have the data. So thank you yeah. for stressing that. 
And we've and now got over a million people on the move. I mean, yeah, yeah. we've already passed a million. Yes, gosh. And I, I was thinking of you, uh, uh, of course, over the weekend, given that we first met in Moscow, I think. That's right. You and I, yeah. So um, thank you for raising this and for pointing out that uh, what happens in news is quite bizarre. Uh, issues are there in the newspapers for a period of time. And then even though they may still be just as important for reasons, usually to do with other, other things coming in, but they may be to do with editorial policy, they leave the front pages. But that doesn't mean it's all stopped. Mm. And that was one of the reasons why I am really keen for the time being to maintain these fortnightly discussions and to share with you what information I've got and to provide a space where people who are doing the work can speak. I just want to ask a question. Is anybody on from New Zealand at the moment? If so, please give us a shout out. It's relevant, uh, New Zealand or Hong Kong, relevant um, when we get to discussing Laura's question. Annie, thank you. Please uh, continue, come back again if there are other points that you want to raise and go to Rebecca Cantor. Hi, I was gonna sort of bring up the same thing that Annie brought up, this confluence of COVID and war, because we started discussing in the chat that now all the news is sort of about the war or conflict in Ukraine. But I made the point that I think to me, any of that news is news about COVID. And so just to follow up, I don't know if we've faced in modern public health history such a confluence of crises. Mm -hmm. I, I've talked about this throughout the briefings over the years now um, that we've just been facing concomitant crises of social unrest um, mm -hmm. that started here in Chile right before the pandemic. And now we're seeing this huge conflict that who knows when it will end, but then it's coming directly into interaction with the global yeah. COVID pandemic and climate change. Yeah. The three of those are just huge. What's gonna happen when we're back to 40 degree temperatures in Europe and the, and the, and the, the conflict and climate crisis and COVID are still going on? Mm. Um, I really can't think of another time in this past century where it's been this clear of um, confluence of, of distinct but interacting crises, especially mm -hmm. given that we have such global travel. And then lastly, to say here in the Chilean context, as you mentioned, our, our COVID incidence and prevalence here is it's quite high. It's the highest yeah. it's been in a while. And we're supposed to go back to full-time in-person um, teaching and working at the university starting April 1st yeah. with no protocols in place as of now um, yeah. for COVID except for masks and ventilation. And, and we don't even know how that's going to work. And it, it just seems so ironic yeah. given that Chile was, has been so careful for two plus years. And now at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Chile, we're supposed to go back 100% in person starting April 1st with a 12 to 16% COVID prevalence in, in the metropolitan region and, and over 20% in, in the country, which, which again is the highest it's been. And, and we, we've started the fourth dose here um, yeah. in February. Um, so it still chilly plays out to me as an interesting test case. So thank you very much indeed. I'd like to react to this um, in several ways. First of all, uh, in the work we've been doing on food, as a follow up to last year's Food Systems Summit, we found that there are three major causes of food related shocks in the world. One is the effects of climate change. The second is COVID-19 and the third is conflict. And over the last two months, we can add a fourth word beginning with C to that, which is cost, because uh, the actual cost of 
staples, particularly wheat, and of some oils like sunflower oil, on uh, and world markets has been going up quite steadily. And in the last two weeks, as looks as though it started to accelerate. So I think that there is a confluence, but there is an additional factor, which is rising food and energy prices on international markets. I think uh, it's going to be a tough period. And um, all of us who've got any access to decision-making spaces just need to keep feeding in this vital, vital, vital fact that this group really understands, which is when you've got crises folding over each other like this, it's always poorer people and people who have uh, less power who are most affected and who can end up getting really badly, badly uh, influenced. Uh, for example, the climate, COVID, conflict and cost simultaneous juxtaposition in a number of island nations is creating some very difficult situations right now, particularly because of the challenge of people in the informal sector, people on daily wages being able to get employment. Secondly, there's a phenomenal, almost universal shift in the posture of decision makers all over the world. And basically saying, we've had enough of COVID and we want to stop. And saying also, we're going to, we're going to live with COVID. But there's just one thing being missed out of this. Living with COVID does not mean throwing caution to the wind. Living with COVID doesn't mean sort of just letting the virus do whatever it wants to do. Living with COVID is being smart, just as we're smart as a humanity living with HIV, just as we're smart as humanity living with the risk of motorcycle accidents or living with the risk of being affected by trauma when cars crash. And so we wear seatbelts. You know, we have, as humanity, learned of ways to reduce risks for ourselves and for others. And as we've said in these sessions, since we started early in 2020, there are principles that can be applied to reducing the impact of infectious diseases. And they include preventing transmission, they include protecting the vulnerable, and they include preparing for surges. And, and Frank's telling us, and that's why it's a joy you're here, Frank, that these kinds of precautions are being built in to COVID stable and COVID urgent, your two alternative directions for Wales. But I, I just hope and I hope that chief medical officers of all nations will level with their populations that you know, living with COVID doesn't mean letting it go everywhere. It also doesn't mean trying to stop it completely. And we'll come to that in a second. But it means putting in place the defenses to be able to deal with it, to prevent things becoming very extreme. Now, I'm having real difficulty in sharing this with people, people in very senior positions right now. I say to them, all our experience with infectious diseases is that you need to have the systems in place, particularly to protect the vulnerable, particularly to prepare for surges, and particularly to prevent transmission when the level of the virus, as Frank just said in Wales, when the level of the virus is quite high. But I think none of us, none of us would say, Laura, that we should be working for zero COVID. 
It's not something that I was keen on in 2020, nor was I keen on it in 2021, and nor am I keen on it now. I think instead, one has the systems in place to keep the numbers as low as possible, the systems in place to protect people who are are high risk, the systems in place to prevent uh, transmission uh, when the virus levels are high, particularly in enclosed spaces, and the systems in place to prepare for things going bad. So I just wanted to say that to you. And did you want to come back, Laura, and make any comment on this? Yes, if possible. Thank you, David. So I mean, remember, I don't know if you remember, but we spoke relatively early on in the pandemic and we discussed about the sort of cluster nature of COVID and how it was at least theoretically possible to get around a cluster and stamp it out. Um, and people weren't really doing that. So that's sort of part of the reason why I asked the question. I, I, I guess that everybody agrees, at least with Omicron, that it wouldn't be possible. But China showed it was possible. That's the reason that New Zealand, New Zealand followed the example. And I also wondered if uh, if long COVID had changed the calculation now that we know, um, you know what a menace it is. And uh, at least some um, people working in that area seem to fear that there might be a future wave of neurodegenerative disease. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just wondered if that had changed the calculation. Yeah. You know, obviously it would be easier to do right at the beginning. So yeah. that, that, that brings me to the last part of my question was whether it should be on the table the next time around if we have another yeah. coronavirus pandemic. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, my colleagues at WHO have been quite cautious about promoting zero COVID, but have been very clear that you can at least, especially if you're quick and firm when things start, you can prevent it from becoming widespread in society. And, and, and I think it's trying to reduce the overall quantum of virus in a population, hugely important, because if you've got an awful lot of virus, that is what creates the opportunity for these tricky variants to emerge. But I, I must say, it, we've been somewhat released, I suppose, from trying to go for zero COVID because of the finding, especially with the latest variant, that mortality is quite low, especially in immunized populations. But just supposing it becomes clear over the next year or two that out of those who've, who've got long COVID or who've had COVID in the past, there is a heightened incidence of cardiovascular disease or of neurogenerative disease or of mental illness, for example, perhaps even leading to self-harm. That will, I think, completely change the calculus. I was gonna ask Frank, if you're still listening, how, how much, I mean, I've asked you before, but I, I still want to push you. How much does long COVID affect your thinking as you're working through with your colleagues in Wales, thinking through the best strategies right now? Yeah, it, it does affect uh, thinking, David, um, but probably, I mean, we have to remember, you know, it's uh, politicians that decide and make decisions and it's, uh, you know, CMOs and scientists who, who advise, yeah. but absolutely it does factor in. The problem with long COVID, of course, is, you know, I mean, you're right to speculate on what it might bring. Um, but uh, there's still so much that we just don't know about it. Mm. So, you know, our approach to long COVID has to be uh, that we need to get, you know, garner the evidence, but we should be, we should be cautious. And it's another reason, as mm. you rightly say, to even though things are COVID stable in terms of hospitalizations, to, 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 to not be too complacent about high levels of community transmission. So yeah. I agree with that. And as we identify new variants, you know, in the COVID urgent situation, then, you know, you have to stamp on them. So you try and keep them down as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit of an, in the unknown space, but it, it, it certainly is something that you have to factor in, absolutely. And I, so, I have to go now. I'll, I'll... yeah, thanks, Frank. That was just, uh, uh, it's delicious having you here. Thank you. And please come anytime. Uh, uh, very, very nice. Laura. 
I mean, here you, you hear it from somebody who's dealing with these issues uh, for his population. Um, I didn't check with Frank whether he was talking on the record or off the record, Laura, so it might be circumspect not to quote uh, too much. I don't think he said anything was tricky. But, but do you want to come back? Because I, I think long COVID is the giant unknown in all this. I don't have any reason to rate it super high or, or, or whatever. I just think it's, it's something about which there is still lots to be found. And it may be that we'll find that it's not associated with higher risks of things. That in, in itself will be important. But the, the Veterans Administration study from the US published last month is pretty serious. And, and that's the one that's got me quite nervous. And if one also finds that there is some uh, central nervous system uh, risks, uh, then that's going to add to things. So I, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm remain nervous, uh, but I haven't got any evidence to lead me to therefore go to any particular policy recommendations about the long COVID risk. Back to you, Laura, and we'll see if anybody else wants to come in on this. Yeah, just a, just a quick comment. So um, first of all, regarding Frank, uh, I won't quote him without asking his permission, um, but uh, I, I, um, I just, of course, the problem with long COVID is uncertainty by definition. Um, but I just, I had an essay recently in Nature about the whole disability thing. I mean, every pandemic in modern times that's been measured, we've had this kind of penumbra of disability that came after it. So it could have been expected, even if we don't know what nature, what, you know, what, what form it will take. Um, and it has really never been factored in. I mean, we all we talk about is cases and infections and hospitalizations and deaths. And, and I just wondered if there was a, you know, I don't have a position, of course I don't. I'm just asking the question. I'm fascinated to hear the experts discuss it. But um, I, I just wonder if there is a, a, a learning moment, an opportunity to learn here, uh, you know, in terms of pandemic preparedness. Well, uh, if Maria Van Kakova, the technical lead on COVID, at the World Health Organization were here now, I can predict that she would be saying to you, uh, Laura, we are taking this on board. It is something that we've really learnt we have to take seriously because there was such a lot of people with, um, uh, and I can't remember the exact name for it in the, the WHO definitions, but. There were a lot of people with it, and they were basically petitioning the World Health Organization saying, recognize this problem. And uh, I just, I just, um, uh, let's just stay connected. I'd very, very much like, if you're continuing to work on this, to introduce you to Maria Van Kerkhove, if you don't know her, uh, because I find the way in which she has internalized this with her colleagues particularly Janet Diaz in the clinical team at the WHO. Really, really interesting. Here you are, Catherine Deland. Catherine, I invite you to come in now, say what you've written in the chat and then go to Jack because it's, it's we have a bit after half time. I lost the time. Off you go, Catherine. No, I, I, I was gonna signal you, but the conversation was too interesting. It wasn't, it wasn't a good time to interrupt. Um, just to let everybody know, WHO is calling it post-COVID-19 condition. And I think the reason for that is that it, the, the variability across individuals and populations for what quote unquote long COVID is looking like is so broad that they're not ready to have a, a single, they wanna use the word condition in particular. That was what I understood in speaking with her and others at WHO. But in the, in the moment, let us take a look at Jack's illustration. Jack, walk us through a little bit of it, if you would. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. I mean, I don't think there's anything here that isn't um, uh, anyone wouldn't recognize. It's obviously the emphasis on protect, prevent and prepare. Um, and then, well, I mean, the, the thing that resonates with me, always resonates at these sessions is, is the emphasis on, needing to work together and kind of creating those um, cross di difference and disagreement sort of uh, collaborations is the only way that um, you kind of 
create a robust response to this. But um, yeah, not much else to say. Um, thanks for having us here as always. And um, I hope the drawing isn't too negative, but um, uh, it's a real treat to be here. So yeah, thanks for having us as always. I think the fact that you have protect, prevent, prepare and work together in the biggest letters possible, what keeps it from being negative. Don't worry. I mean, there's, we got to have the good and the bad here. There's a yin and yang in this and uh, both sides of the messages have to come through. Mm. Thanks so much, Jack. I, I really like that you've also included the Ukrainian refugees. Um, movement of people, particularly people who don't have a lot is, is a huge influencer in outbreaks. And um, gosh, we do need to see what we can do to help and, and keep our eye on that. With that, David, I think um, we have 14 minutes. Back to you. Thank you. Um, before we finish, uh, John Atkinson will be invited to make some comments on really leadership at this time and what he as a mentor in systems leadership would encourage. There are other people who John and I have worked with on this issue who are on the call. If they're still on at the end, John, I encourage you yourself to bring them in and invite them to say a word or two. So I will try to stop quite quickly so you have some time. Uh, I did want to invite Scott Knox to say a word or two. Uh, Scott has been active in the chat. He's had, we've had serious conflicts going on during COVID-19 uh, and um, we should not be focusing on any one conflict as though it's a first. Uh, and indeed, you may have some observations more generally, Scott, on getting the message right, because you talked about that last week, and we, uh, like two weeks ago, we exchanged emails during the, during the two weeks. Uh, you might want to talk about uh, conflict and what that means, and there may be other issues that you want to bring up. Scott Knox from Toronto, you have the floor. Yeah, I was just, um, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to make a huge statement about the conflict issue. Um, it was just, I, I think, uh, uh, as uh, our, my industry has been reflecting on its role and what it can do uh, around what's happening in Ukraine, I've been sort of questioning myself. Um, one of the, the world's largest advertising group, WPP, has literally just announced an hour ago closing all Russian operations. And so the only unprecedented thing I think I'm seeing here with what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, is, is that corporations and, and brands making decisions and Netflix is out and also, which is quite unusual. But as far as conflict is concerned, and I was saying it really in the context of maybe there's something we can learn from, uh, there was a mention in the chat about Ebola and uh, Syria and, and, you know, that there have been, we have had pandemics in war zones. And, and so if we're looking for learnings and what we can understand, I was just simply referring to that. As far as communications and, and messaging, uh, it, it is, it's gonna be an interesting time even for that because the headlines have been taken over by Ukraine. Uh, I don't think it's a surprise because it involves a world power like Russia. It's also, let's be quite honest with the elephant in the room here, it's a white war in Europe. So when it's uh, people of color war elsewhere, it's not really top agenda. Uh, and so that, that's why we've got this global media focus on Ukraine. Um, and, 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 but, but, but it does leave a strategic issue for those in the healthcare profession and WHO and, and other organizations. And how do you continue the narrative around COVID and, whether we talk about the three Ps or, or all of those things, we're now in a battle landscape for media headlines. And, and when the world was already starting to shift away from COVID conversation, it's how do we do that within the noise of what's been talked about in Ukraine, which is a real dilemma, mm. um, but is a communications challenge for any corporation or, or, or entity because sometimes you're not the top story. So how do you make yourself the top story? Is it relevant to make yourself the top story? And I'm sure there are, bigger brain, brains and communications somewhere mm. in the world working for WHO, considering all of those options. But it's gonna be, you know, as people are, I think the real thing here really is mental health mm. for countries that aren't directly involved with the conflict. And I think what I'm picking up certainly in Canada and from my friends and colleagues in the United Kingdom is we've been being 
traveling through the pandemic for the past two years, uh, isolated the mental health issues with that, pour on top of that a very visible media rally cry around what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, and everybody, I think, is just like, oh, God, what else? I don't then detract from people who live in the Middle East or uh, the African continent who, who will look at this and go, well, yeah, sorry, look, let's have a look at the white battle going on over there. We've been having this for decades. So what are you saying about us? Again, mental health issues about perspective and your place in the world. And so I think there's going to be a lot in the mix here over the next few months uh, that we're going to have to contend with. And then how do we continue to support our messaging through about COVID through that mm. noise and cognitive overload, frankly? Yeah. So it's going to be layered, L-A-Y-E-R-E-D. I don't quite know how um, we all cope with this layering of a combination of um, real anxiety, misery, sadness, pain, the various forms of vicarious suffering that we have uh, linked to concerns about public health and concerns about equity. Thanks for putting voice to it, Scott. Now, I'd like to move, if I may, to John Atkinson. John, I, I, I put you on the spot a bit, saying what are the implications for leadership? I'm encouraging you to run it how you like, um, uh, if you go much after half past, then I expect numbers will drop. And there are a couple of people I'd like to say ho hello to, relatives of mine and friends, tweeze on. So I'd like to have a moment to say hello to these good people before we finish. John, please. Thanks, David. I think if I go longer than a few minutes, people will start to drop. Uh, but I would, I'd like to just start by asking Holly, Holly Wheeler, if you're still on to just comment briefly um, on the comment you put in the chat about this relationship between modeling and, and change of behavior. I think, that, I think that links to some of the things David was saying and might be worth unpacking a little. So Holly, are you, are you still with us and able to speak? Hey John, yes, I'm, I'm free and here. I'm very pleased to see you all. Um, what I was thinking about is how discourse develops between what happens in the media, what leaders say and then what people do and that we can't afford to forget the fact that when you put modeling out into the world that is the thing that can contribute to changing people's behavior and if we don't create that link as leaders about what's going on then after that uh, if you put modeling out people will say all oh, the modeling was wrong whereas it wasn't it had an impact so part of the leadership role or describing the narrative about what's happening is to make those connections for people. And I think that's relevant to some of the things that you're talking about in terms of um, the confluence of how things connect together and, and to try to help people make sense of that so it doesn't feel overwhelming and so that you can engage with that. So for me, one of the really important roles over the next year, I think, is about leaders' jobs to connect things together and help people make sense and to be really receptive to what's present in people's minds at the moment. So that's my initial thought, John. Thanks, Holly. And I think that connects very well to, to where I wanted to go and where David came into this. Uh, and Holly, because she and I have worked together, will have heard the phrase before, managers make plans and leaders make and tell stories. And the, the thing about stories is different to plans is they can hold the sort of messiness of a very complex situation. We've, 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 you know, there's been all sorts running through the chat about all the things that are happening at once in a place. Stories can hold that messiness where a plan can't, can't deal with all of that. And that shapes how we act when that sort of complexity begins to overwhelm us and, and we're not quite sure how, how we pull all that together. So what's the story that leaders now tell? Well, it's got to acknowledge and honour all that's happened so far. People have been through a lot and not to name that and to hold that and to recognise that is an omission. But it's also got to carry the hope for the future that people now hold, that the, 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 the sense that maybe things are changing, maybe things are getting better, certainly seem to be for some. 
Um, but I think most importantly, I think it needs to capture the patterns that have emerged over time of, of, of how the pandemic in, unfolds, how the patterns of the disease take place, these surges, these spikes, these swirls, of how we respond to those and the impacts of our responses. And in that way, we learn collectively by making visible and accessible to everyone uh, the connection between information and activity and response. And so how does it now shape and hold the different perspectives that we hold, recognising that people do see things differently, but that small and vocal minorities have a point of view, but not a uh, unique and correct view on what goes on. So that if we can hold all that together, then what the story does is connect the behaviour change that David was describing at the start, uh, you know, more people doing more of the right things, more of the time through choice. Um, it connects that behavior change with this circumstance, with the environment, and therefore people change their behavior, maybe slowly, maybe a little bit belatedly, maybe a little bit clumsily, but more accurately and uh, more likely in tune with what's needed. So as leaders, uh, people who influence the role is to construct the stories that we now need to create the environment within which people do those changes that we're hoping uh, enable us to live much more comfortably uh, in the years ahead. Thanks, David. Thank you, John, very much indeed. Uh, and everybody, uh, managers make plans, leaders tell stories, that more people doing more of the right things at the right time through choice is something that John has, consistently said that we're working for in our COVID work and then being able to name and hold what people have been through, carry the hope for the future and capture the patterns that have unfolded in stories. Well, it's what we try to do. Um, would anybody like to come in and react to what John has said? If so, uh, shout out. Try and stay on the same theme if you can. Uh, Peter. Right, can you hear me? Uh, uh, the thing I would say on the modeling issue uh, um, is that um, as engineers, we use models a lot, but the, the epidemiological models tended to be based on what you were trying to control, your infection rates, hospitalizations and deaths. And uh, that's pretty, uh, that means that a lot of your predictions and the actions that you're calling for are very much delayed. And I think one of the lessons, we were watching what was happening in the Far East where they jumped very much more quickly. And I think there are other ways that engineering project managers use for risk management all the time, yeah. where we could have forecast things a lot further a lot faster and acted much more quickly and perhaps avoided the need for lockdowns and more draconian measures. And I hope we will hang on to that for the next pandemic uh, because also people are very much uh, um, better at managing their own risk and uh, hopefully we can give them the means and the advice to do, do that most effectively. Thank you. Uh, this last week I've given a short interview to somebody researching lockdowns, and I have repeated the point that I made last year, which is that in my view, and I think the view of everybody in the WHO, lockdowns should never be the primary means of controlling an infectious disease. They're last resort activities. But there was a point during 2020 when about half the world was in some form of lockdown, a pretty serious state of affairs. So thank you very much, Peter, for making that point. And it's one that already courses through this group. So thanks uh, also to Marianne Hasselgrave, who's been communicating with me about a number of things, but most particularly uh, about what's happening in the Pacific. At least that's what's relevant to here. Thank you for that. I'd like to invite Annie and Keith Appleyard, who I saw were alight just now. I hope you're still on. Are you still on, Annie yeah. and Keith? Yes, we are. You were going to say something. I'd love you to make the point that you were going that you were saying in the chat and to expand on that a bit if you like. Please be as contextual as you like. 
Um, we mentioned right at the very start of the conversation how people had um, self-isolated over December, January in order to stop the spread of the disease. We um, deliberately stayed away from all of our grandchildren and the last pack of Christmas presents is being delivered tomorrow, nearly three months late. Wow. We were doing it selfishly because we were due on a cruise in the Caribbean in the middle of January, and we thought, we're well, blowed if we're going to miss the cru the cruise just because mm. we gave the kids their presents on time. Oh, uh, gosh. Well, I must say, there's so much COVID that's been around over the last few months that uh, I suspect you've probably played, taken very wise decisions. I hope mm. you're both well. And Annie, yeah. it's lovely to see you. Thank you for you, very, David. very much for joining. Uh, enjoy listening. Thank you. Uh, we really like it. So Annie and me are brother and sister. There we go. And uh, I'm now wanting to ask Twee if she would un uh, flick her switch. Here you are, Twee. Twee. Hello. Uh, would you like uh, to uh, just have a moment or two just to describe who it is in your hands and also to react to what you've heard today. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Lara. Lovely to meet you all. <laughs> now, uh, no, just, uh, just a word on the leader leadership and telling mm. stories. We are all leaders also in our worlds too. And so we have stories to tell. So for me, for example, I'll continue wearing my mask just because the mandates have stopped doesn't mean masks are less effective. And my, my story for now is I don't want this little one getting sick, not even from a little cold, let alone COVID, when we don't know the effects of long COVID at the moment. And then just to remind you some things we've talked about in previous open online briefings is, is think about the audience when you're telling these stories and then make sure you share your perspective. If you're sharing it from the perspective of your family or your country or from a global perspective, which we often do in these briefings, that's really important as well, particularly if you may be talking to people in your family who are who may be from groups which are anti-vax or, or anti-mandate. Um, and then that that's a way to keep it positive and, and, and share that we're all trying to get through this and some of us find it harder than others. Tweed, did your mum get back to New Zealand okay? She did, she did. She was in a, a lovely hotel for two weeks before she was let out. She said the... Um, the, the whole process was very alarming after having spent four months in Europe where everything was quite laid back and to, to go to the hotel and there's every, everyone's in hazmat suits mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't take her passport. She had to hold it at the screen at the customs border. So it's quite extreme, but now the cases are so high. I think she's, she's seeing it become closer to, to what she saw here. Yes. Thank you very much, Twee. Twee um whose mum was over for the birth of Lara uh, and just went, was lucky to get back. It was a lottery to get one of the slots for getting on the plane and then getting into quarantine and was delighted that she was able to do so. So thank you. Thank you for being with us, Twee. Well, everybody, that, uh, those were, I wanted to greet my sister Anne and her husband Keith, and I also wanted to greet Twee and Lara. Um, and I think with that, uh, it's now time to go to Mihika, who is uh, actually taken over from Twee as our lead on communications in Forestry. Mihika, would you like to close us? Thank you. Sure. Um, I can also share the, I can hang on, let me just, yeah, so I can do this while. Well, <laughs> Okay, so thank you everyone for sharing. I mean, this picture. discussion in the chat has been really, really interesting as well. And the last few weeks, I think, have felt really like a turning point of sorts mm. uh, with uncertainties adding to um, everything, and including what Maria van Kerkhove actually called a period of false dichotomies. Mm. And through this, I think what helps also to keep a bit positive is to think about how far we have come the tools we have collected on the way to stop transmission and other things and as Twee said to carry on doing what we feel is right as well and to mask and do that and to just to protect uh, our loved ones 
and also to think about collaboration at all levels, like Jack mentioned, and this is an amazing uh, growing. Um, and also looking at what Scott Knox mentioned about media noise, um, I think it's also vital to keep a global lens uh, and lenses actually when looking at issues um, as we don't work in neutral spaces. And we need to use power in politicized spaces to empower and enable people and individuals and communities. So that's all from me. Thank you everybody for attending. When's the next one? Mahika. It's in two weeks, so on the 20, no, oh, sorry. 18th. Yeah, 18th. So there we go. We will do it again, and we will try to keep doing it again every two weeks. Uh, it doesn't always work, but we will do our best, and we really thank you for coming. And please, if you, if you, we, we will create more space for interaction. Uh, me being giving shorter presentations, just as we've done today. So don't hesitate to come, bring your friends, keep the conversation going about long COVID, keep the conversation going about global. And with that, bye-bye. Thanks to all.